the leader of the free world. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ah, yes. Leading the world's most awkward of sing-alongs through four smiles, the weight of international insecurity and domestic upheaval bearing down on almost all. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Olaf. Happy it may have been the German Chancellor being serenaded, but the Ukrainian president and Pope are the star guests at this gathering. Thank you for your prayers for Ukraine, Ukrainians. They met on the sidelines of this week's G7 summit. Their galvanizing impact, though, drew reaction one and a half thousand miles away. The conditions are very simple. Ukrainian troops must be completely withdrawn from the Donetsk, Luhansk People Republic, Kherson, Zaporizhia region. Surrender of Ukrainian territory he does not even fully control. Regime change in Kyiv and dropping their bid to join NATO. Russia's demands for a ceasefire announced this afternoon. Retaliation to deals done overnight. The US guaranteeing military and training aid for a decade to come. And the G7 agreeing to unlock frozen Russian assets to raise almost £40 billion to hand to Ukraine. But these bold moves belie the precarious ground many of these weakened leaders tread. The president of France called a snap election after heavy losses to the far right. President Biden now trailing in the polls just ahead of a US election. Extra guest India's Narendra Modi re-elected with a weakened majority and the UK's own prime minister. And the stakes could hardly be higher. The world today is more dangerous than it's been for decades. That's why the UK has made a hard and fast pledge to increase defence spending to 2.5% of GDP by 2030. Whoever wins this general election will fly to Washington for a NATO summit just days after the result and immediately face the enormity of the task in hand. We do have both an ongoing conflict in Europe, unfolding crises in the Middle East. We have a world where some of the UK's most enduring alliances have big question marks around them. You know, we don't know what's going to happen in the US election. We're at a bit of a turning point. You know, we have an expensive welfare state. We have an aging population. So a lot of calls on the public purse at home. But also we're kind of potentially looking at the end of, of the sort of post-Cold War peace dividend. Lots of European countries are having to think now about how are we going to fund defence? What kind of defence do we need in the world? So that's, that's real. Equally, there's a sense that the parties have picked up on this idea that voters feel insecure. Rishi Sunak has put defence front and centre of the Conservatives' campaign, starting it by announcing a national service scheme and repeating time and again the world would be a less safe place with Labour in power. Will Ukraine get the same support under a Labour government? The entire Labour Party is so united in support of Ukraine, will give Ukraine the support it requires until the Ukrainians win. I think the whole UK is united in this. It is an essential mission and it's fundamentally about the national security of all of Europe. And is that an unwavering commitment regardless of the cost? There's no spending cap on this. We will be supporting Ukraine until Ukraine wins. A lot of people would look at it and say, that's, that's fair enough and that's big rhetoric, but ultimately in your manifesto, you haven't committed solidly to raising defence spending to 2.5 of GDP. It's an aspiration, but it's not a commitment. We have made a very strong argument that the economy has to be stronger before there's a whole range of longer term improvements in public services that we can deliver. The Prime Minister marched into the G7 trailing Labour in the polls. He will turn trailing the Reform Party in one poll and having made commitments he may well not be in office for to deliver. Well, joining me now is Bronwyn Maddox, the director of the foreign policy think tank Chatham House. When Vladimir Putin looks at this gathering of leaders, weakened, facing elections, resurgent right wings, about to be turfed out, is he laughing? Yes. And he's picking his moment to undermine not just the G7, but the big summit on uh, trying to help Ukraine that starts tomorrow in Switzerland. Uh, about 90 countries gathering to see what can be done about that. So it is entirely positional, this uh, supposed offer that he's made. He wants to put himself, uh, apparently, even if there's only the, 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 the merest uh, claim to that being well-founded, that he wants to put himself on the moral high ground and say to the world, I am offering the peace deal and uh, get it and undermine uh, all the things the G7 is doing 
to get at him. I mean, there's some future proofing being attempted, isn't there, with the Biden, um, you know, deal being signed. Uh, yet, Putin knows that if Trump were to win in November, everything changes. He has high hopes, I think, that if Trump were to win, that some of the things that Trump has said about doing a deal immediately would be to his advantage. Though Trump is, uh, by his very nature, unpredictable, and even Vladimir Putin couldn't, couldn't count on that, but he is trying to rattle the G7 and to make them think, I, I would suspect, particularly France and Germany, make them think, look, is there an alternative way? Are we at some point going to be talking about a deal? But also, as you, as you, as you said, they have been doing some things to toughen up on Russia, even in the past couple of days, raising this loan against frozen Russian assets to, to give money to Ukraine, tightening up on Russian sanctions. So the G7, even if weakened, as your colleagues were saying, uh, the individual leaders, uh, it is not without bite. Um, foreign policy hasn't really featured in this election campaign back home yet very much. Um, there's just been this argument about defence spending. Um, where does that leave us in terms of the next government and the direction it might pursue? There's only one word that really differentiates the two parties on paper in any significant way, and that is Rwanda. Uh, you can argue about whether or not that is foreign policy or domestic policy because it's about migration. But there they are starkly different. And you have a bit of a, a, a difference of tone on Europe, where Labour wants to get as close to Europe without mentioning the word Brexit or customs union or anything like that, as Europe might, might um, allow. Um, but then you don't have very much difference at all. And that is part of the reason that I think it hasn't featured very... Uh, prominently in all this. And the other, the other reason is that they really, neither of them, want to talk about Europe. That has been so toxic in any kind of electoral context. So they've got no reason to. On the other hand, there is an awful lot of foreign policy around. Ukraine affects the security um, of Europe. It is the, the main thing pushing up those defence numbers, saying Britain and other countries need to think very hard about their very ordinary defence, how to make more ammunition and artillery and that kind of thing. And it, it, um, it, it, you know, it is, it is destabilising for fuel prices yeah. and all kinds of things. But, but there could be really big things happening over the next year or so on all sorts of fronts, whether it's Ukraine or China, Taiwan or the Middle East. Um, do we have a strong sense of what, you know, a possible Prime Minister Starmer would be doing on all of these fronts? He's taken a very um, uh, deliberate, if you like, front foot approach to all this. And, and Labour has not always liked that gut talking very much about defence or about wars or indeed about the United States or things, um, preferring to talk about development aid and how Britain can work with other countries uh, abroad. But he has been quite trenchant, uh, Keir Starmer, in saying, look, we're completely behind Ukraine, uh, we're behind defence, uh, we're behind Britain taking a very assertive role in the world. Um, so that's all we have to go on. So not but a lot of change. Not a lot of change, <laughs> except possibly on Gaza, and there we have to see because of the strains that has caused in his party. Bromley Malik, thank you very much. Now, in the election, one new opinion poll shows the Reform Party overtaking the Conservatives, leading Nigel Farage to claim today he is the real leader of the opposition. The YouGov poll for The Times put Labour way out in front with 37% of the vote, but it also shows support for reform rising two points to 19%, while the Conservatives were unchanged on 18. Numbers, it says, are within the margin of error. And the Lib Dems aren't far behind on 14. But other polls show the Tories still ahead of reform. This from the pollster Electoral Calculus is based on opinion polls carried out over the last week. It puts reform on 14.8%, behind the Conservatives on 219 and is similar to most other poll aggregators. But turn that into the number of seats it predicts, and other predictions are out there. Each party will win, and you see Labour with a massive majority, the Conservatives with just 80, the Lib Dems not far behind with 63. Reform wins just one seat on that projection, fewer than the Greens. Well, earlier, I spoke to former government directors of communication, Alistair Campbell and Craig Oliver, for Labour and the Conservatives, respectively, as well as Professor Rosie Campbell of King's College, London. And I started by asking Craig Oliver what he thought of the Conservative campaign so far. 
I think three things are probably clear. The first is it clearly was a massive mistake to hold an early election for the Conservative Party. It's a serious problem for them. The second thing is I think the media is finding it much easier to cover the Tories in meltdown story than they are what on earth is Labour going to do in power. And I think the other more interesting story, which I think we'll probably get to towards the end of the campaign, is exactly what is Labour going to do in power? Is it painting itself into a corner by ruling out a whole load of things during the campaign so that they're not awkward now, but in the future may be real chickens that come home to roost? Alistair, how do you think it's gone this week? I think it's been pretty catastrophic for the Conservatives. I, I feel that the D-Day fiasco was kind of defining. I just think it was one of those moments where people thought, this guy just can't do the job. Um, and I think he's, his confidence has looked very, very low, whereas I think Keir Starmer's confidence has risen. I also think that neither of the main parties can really work out how to deal with Nigel Farage. Farage, to my mind, still gets treated more like a kind of, you know, cheeky, chappy comedian than he does a, as a very dangerous populist politician. But he's riding that. He's really tweaking the Tories' tail the whole time. Rosie, how, how seismic do you think the reform position is this week? Well, it's not seismic if we look at raw numbers. I think, you know, we see an incremental increase. But I think in terms of the potential impact on the Conservative vote, it could be seismic in that it's splitting the vote um, in constituencies that perhaps we wouldn't have thought of as being marginal in the past are going to be marginal. And if, if um, reform do as well as they are in the polls right now, the Conservatives will lose many more cons constituencies than they were expecting to. Uh, and so what, what effect do you think is, is... Is it going to be, you know, the, the end result is even fewer Conservative MPs and a very weak opposition. Yes, I think possibly with Farage in Parliament as well, but who knows? But that, that's the most likely outcome indeed. Craig, I mean, doesn't that raise even stronger the possibility of Farage leading the right? Yeah, no, look, and he's definitely out there trying to suggest that that could be the case. I mean, my personal view is the Conservative Party would be absolutely insane to allow him in. And there are certain people in the Conservative Party who definitely think it's the solution. Personally, I think it would be the end of the Conservative Party, certainly for a, a, a long period of time. Look, Obviously, what is clear now is that they are running a defensive campaign and they are trying to minimise the number of seats Labour get. That is a very difficult position to be in, especially with three weeks to go. Alistair, is there a danger that every, if everybody thinks Labour's going to win anyway, you get a much stronger protest vote and you could get a surprising result? I think, I think it is a problem for Labour. Labour have got to fight this election every day like they think they can lose it, even though everybody's saying that it's all over. I think one th the other thing, issue that I think will start to come into closer into view is the whole issue of the electoral system. That debate is going to get very complicated. If Labour were to get a massive majority on a, you know, sub 40% kind of vote, if reform were to get several million votes, but maybe no MPs, if the Liberal Democrats, which is entirely possible, were to get 40, 50 seats on exactly the same share of the vote as they had Last time, that debate, I think, is one that maybe is going to start to emerge in the second half of the campaign. Yeah, I mean, Rosie, there's going to be an increasing unfairness argument, isn't there, when we look at this result? Yeah, although it is, it is, I mean, I can see, I absolutely can see Alice's point. But on the other hand, there are many places that have been safe seats for many, many years when nobody's ever knocked on their door, who suddenly people are noticing them. So actually, there will be a lot of people in the electorate who suddenly feel that this election is relevant to them in the way it hasn't been in previous years. But, but the, we, we could be in a situation come Friday the 5th where Keir Starmer has got less votes than Jeremy Corbyn got um, at the last election, but has a landslide majority. I mean, it's just going to make our democracy look mad, isn't it? Yes, but then what's the mechanism for fixing that? Because I think a Labour Party with a massive majority is very unlikely to take on electoral reform. Well, I mean, Alistair, isn't Labour leaving a vacuum for reform to fill? You know, we had their manifesto, and there's nothing to talk about because there's nothing new in it. So it hasn't sparked a debate, and that's left the way clear for Nigel Farage to fill the gap. No, I don't agree with that. I, I, I think that you're, I, they made a virtue of having essentially put out the main elements of their policy proposals in advance. That Yesterday was all about saying, you say there's no policy, you say there's no plan, here's a lot of policy, and it represents a plan. I do think there's a real problem with neither of the main parties kind of wanting to engage with Nigel Farage and his, pop his populist politics on its own terms, which means that Farage is allowed to carry on playing this game of almost being like a sort of the Johnson figure of modern politics. So would you Not go out really and attack him now, if you were running the Labour campaign? 
I would I, I would certainly be going after the damage that populism has done to this country. And I think that Farage represents a very dangerous force in our politics and, and we, you know, we should pander to it at our peril. Craig. Look, I don't disagree with any of that. But look, I keep thinking about a word cloud that I saw from one of the pollsters this week, which is basically words describing the election. And the dominating word by a factor of 10 was boring. That is because the Labour Party, despite what Alistair is saying, is not really giving us a clear picture of what it's going to do in government. And I think that actually that is something that they could do. They can afford to say, look, we can do this. And I think we've got to a stage where people are so worried about losing the election that, let's face facts, they've already won. Well, they might they might say, well, look, look what happened with Theresa May. You know, she tried to come out with some big ideas yeah, but and I, totally I, messed it up. So I totally understand that point. But you don't have to go around ruling everything out. So every time the Conservatives pop up and say you're going to do VAT or what about the triple lock on pensions, you don't have to say we're ruling out the VAT thing or we're, we're going to keep the triple lock on pensions for the next five years. These things seem to me to be very, very strange things to commit to, um, given that they know that they're going to go in. It could be very difficult. Alistair, if you were advising Rishi Sunak and trying to pull his campaign back on the rails, what would you be saying? I guess the only thing he's got left now is to show there's a bit of fight in him. Um, but, you know, the, the truth is, I think he's he's fallen victim to coming on the end of two of the worst prime ministers in the country's history. Johnson and Trust did massive damage to the Conservative Party. He hasn't differentiated them himself from them enough. Uh, he's pandered to the right of his party rather than challenging it. And I'm afraid he's reaping what he sows. So I guess if I was being a genuine friend to him, I'd just say, look, try and enjoy it and get out the other end alive. <laughs> Craig, if you were advising Keir Starmer... Well, look, I think it's really difficult when they're clearly... It's working for them, right? You know, look, the, the temptation is to say to the Labour Party, just keep going, keep being boring, keep batting it off. I actually genuinely do think that they should show more leg. I think they should go out there and talk a lot more about what they are actually going to do in government and some real pressing problems that are going to be on their agenda very, very soon. And I think that they will find in the five or even ten years that they're in power that having done that would have been a massive benefit to them. They can afford to do it, go out there, use the final three weeks of this campaign to start putting some flesh on the bone. Rosie, Craig and Alistair, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.